So welcome to today's presentation on birds of Florida. Again, my name is Lara Milligan. I'm the natural resources agent with UF IFAS Extension, Pinellas County. So there are several hundred species of birds in Florida. So we're only going to be touching on a handful. And I know this still looks like an overwhelming list. But what we're going to do today is highlight a few species of birds where there's two species that look similar to one another and I'm going to go through some ways to tell them apart and then we'll share some other tidbits of information about them as well. And then Shannon and I always like to include ways that you can help. So I will provide that information with species where it's applicable. So today's presentation was inspired by a field guide called, oops, oops, <laughs> this or that. And it's a new field guide that me and my colleague James Stevenson put together uh, that discusses commonly misidentified species in Florida. And it doesn't only touch on birds, but that's the part I'm going to present to you today. Um, it goes through plants and trees and mammals and reptiles. So if you guys are interested in that, it's available through the UF IFAS bookstore. So you're getting a little sneak peek into that today. So first up is the turkey vulture versus the black vulture. We're kind of starting with some of our big birds and ones that you'll often see. So we have the turkey vulture here on the left and the black vulture here on the right. And so we're gonna go through some different ways to tell them apart. So when we are talking about vultures, one thing to look at is the head. And so you can see on the turkey vulture, it's got kind of a reddish pink color to it compared to the black head of the black vulture. So that's a little bit helpful. I included a picture of a turkey down here because turkeys have a reddish head as well. So you can maybe associate those two as a helpful tip. Um, another thing to look at is um, the wing tips. So it, when they're in flight and their wings are spread out, you can see there's lighter coloration on the tips of the black vulture's wings. And on the turkey vulture, the wing, the lighter coloration is kind of at the bottom edge of their wings. And you can kind of think about it like it makes a T shape. So T for turkey vulture. For those of you that are in the marine world, for me, this is what worked for me. I think of black tip shark. And so the tips of the black vulture are lighter in color. I don't know, it, weird things work for me, so that might work for you as well. Um, and then also in flight, so the tail of the turkey, so think turkey tail, they have a little bit of a longer tail that's held out in flight versus kind of the shorter, more stubby tail of the black vulture. All right, so now on to red-shouldered hawk versus red-tailed hawk. So you can see hawks in general all look similar, especially in the head area. And so these two in particular are easy to confuse. Um, you will more often see a red-shouldered hawk versus a red-tailed hawk, but I'm gonna go over some ways to tell them apart if you're ever unsure. So with the red-shouldered hawk, again, when we're looking at these two species in flight and looking at the underside of the wing. Um, on the red-shouldered hawk, you can see at the very edge of both of their wings, there's kind of this lighter coloration. We call them like little transparent windows on the edges of their wings. Um, so you can kind of see that here in this photo that is lacking in the red-tailed hawk. Obviously, the red-tailed hawk <laughs> kind of gives its name away. Uh, when they're mature, their tails are kind of this reddish tinge to them, which is very, um, you know, a key characteristic when in flight, you can spot that pretty easily, as opposed to the very different tail of the red-shouldered hawk, which is these thicker bands of black separated by uh, these white stripes here. And the tail of the red-shouldered hawk is a little bit longer, but in general, the colors are obviously quite different. Now, if you don't see them in flight and you see them perched, uh, you want to pay attention to the coloration on the chest of these species. So on the red-shouldered hawk, the kind of red coloration that is on their shoulder carries over to the front of their chest. 
and it's a little bit mottled in with white, kind of like barring there, compared to the more, it's mostly a solid white chest with this like patch or strip of brown modeling on the red tailed hawk. So you can see that in both of the images there on your screen. So in general, the red-tailed hawk is larger than the red-shouldered hawk, but again, if you don't have them side by side, that's uh, not always an easy way to tell them apart. I'm gonna play a call for you, and you just tell me true or false if you think the call that I'm gonna play is the flight call of the red-tailed hawk. Are you ready? So it was the call of the red-tailed hawk. It's often used in movies when they're portraying any large bird, including vultures, or um, especially with eagles, because it's a much fiercer call than that of a bald eagle, if you've ever heard a bald eagle call. Um, so it might be a fun little bit of trivia for you there. So next up, we have the bald eagle versus the osprey. Speaking of the bald eagle. So more likely you're gonna confuse an immature bald eagle, which is shown on the left here with an osprey. The coloration's just more similar, but this is probably what you think of when you think of a bald eagle, the image shown on your left um, with the solid black and white head, our national symbol. So some ways to tell these apart in flight or when they're perched, so one thing is to look at the coloration of the head. So obviously with the bald eagle when they're mature, they have the white head like I mentioned. Ospreys, when they're both juvenile and adults, have a white head, but the distinct brown eye stripes. So that's what you want to look for. That's the key characteristic. It runs like from their eye all the way to the back of their head. And if I go back to the immature bald eagle's head is more brown, but they're lacking the eye stripe, it's a, like a solid brown color. So, oops. And then um, another thing you wanna look at is the chest. So the chest of the osprey is this solid white color. And on the bald eagle, especially when mature, it's gonna be like this dark brown. Um, so you can see that here as well, compared to the very white chest of the osprey. And then, um, you can see even on the immature, it has, it's a kind of a mottled pattern, but it's not the solid white of the osprey. And then while we're here on this slide, we'll point out the tail as well. So the osprey tail has these bands that run along the length of the tail and the coloration on the bald eagle, both immature and mature um, is more of a solid color, whether it's brown or white, but it will not be barred like the osprey. Another thing you can look for, we often think of bald eagles holding their wings out very, very straight and flat. And the osprey will kind of have like these bent elbows when they're flying. Um, we often think like if you're familiar with seagulls and how they look when they're flying, kind of makes like a little W shape with their wings. So both the osprey and the eagle occupy similar habitats. They like to be near water. Um, and if you were familiar with the threats that DDT, the pesticide back in like the 60s and 70s caused with these species, um, there was big declines with both the species causing harm to like thinning of the eggshell. And then just over time, right, who doesn't want to build a house along the coast and on any body of water, which is prime habitat for these species. So some things that you guys can consider if you live in prime habitat for them is installing an artificial nest platform and often if you guys have a local audubon group you can reach out to them and they're often willing to work with you or you can also check out the nest watch um, from the cornell lab of ornithology i will include the link to this in the follow-up email for instructions on things to consider for your nest platform if that's something you want to give a try. Um, 
they do suggest that you place sticks in the nest platform once you um, install it just to kind of get the hint get the ball rolling for them a little bit um, it just helps with uh, adoption of the platform site and then just for your reference the nesting season for ospreys here in florida is typically december all the way through june uh, and you'll often see them in in action building their nest platforms because they tend to pick areas like on light poles and power poles where it's very visible to everyone. And then something you can do that will help both species and really all species that live near the water or on any coastline is pick up and discard any fishing line or rope or anything that can really be utilized by these birds as nesting material because there's often incidents where the young in the nest will either ingest those materials or get entangled in them if they're incorporated into the nest. So anything we can do to pick up litter, it's a win-win, whether it's for species or just the environment uh, and habitat quality in general. All right, so our next species comparison is the Anhinga versus the double-crested cormorant. So we have the Anhinga, here on your left and the double crested cormorant on your right. I know before I kind of got into the birding world, these two were like the same species <laughs> in my brain. So hopefully I'll help you remember how to tell them apart. So first thing you can look at is the shape of their bill. So my colleague James Stevenson does a great job contrasting these two species. Um, he always says, you can remember, the A in Anhinga is like the A of their bill. It's a very sharp pointed beak, contrasting with the curved bill of the <laughs> cormorant. Um, it's a much thicker bill that's hooked at the end. So Anhingas tend to more spear their prey, and whereas uh, the cormorants will grasp onto their prey. Another thing that you can look at is their tails. So Anhingas have a longer, tail in general. You can especially notice this when you see them in flight. It's kind of funny to see an anhinga flying way in the sky. So they have a long tail, but it's also tipped with a lighter band that the um, cormorant is lacking, and they have a little bit of a shorter tail. And then if you don't see them perched out like this, drying their wings, and you see them in the water, the anhinga is sometimes referred to as a snake bird because it looks like a snake <laughs> when it swims in the water, only its head will stick out, whereas the cormorant sits more like a duck, so its body will kind of be floating more up on top of the water. So those are some fun ways to tell those two species apart, and um, I, hope, I hope if nothing else, you at least remember this one out of the presentation. Okay. Now onto woodpeckers. I love woodpeckers and I'll do a quick plug. My colleague, James Stevenson, will be doing a webinar on woodpecker, woodpeckers 101, talking about all the different species of woodpeckers we have here in Florida. So I'll include the link for that as well in the follow-up email if you wanna learn more. Two that don't necessarily look similar but often are referred to as the wrong thing is the red-bellied woodpecker and the red-headed woodpecker. So this is the red-bellied woodpecker here on the left. It's a common woodpecker, especially even in urban areas. The red-headed woodpecker is uh, more rare. It's only kind of seen and found in pockets throughout the state and not as um, adapted to urban areas. I have never seen one of these in Pinellas County. So <laughs> if that means anything to anyone. We're very, very developed here. So some ways to tell these apart. Obviously looking at the head. So the red-headed woodpecker has a solid red head. There is red coloration on the red-bellied woodpecker, but it is not encompassing the whole head. So this is the true name, red-headed woodpecker appropriately called so. You can also see the major difference on the wings. The red-headed woodpecker has very solid colors. It's a, mostly black with a big white patch at the base compared to the checkered pattern on the wings of the red-bellied woodpecker. 
And then another thing you can look at is the color of the bill. So um, the bill of the red-headed woodpecker is a lighter color, more of a pale bill compared to the darker bill of the red-bellied woodpecker. So again, this is gonna be more likely what you see. If you guys do get a chance to see a red-headed woodpecker, to me, it's an awesome, awesome uh, species to just watch. They tend to, they're one of the few woodpecker species that will go around and fly and actively catch their food. So they're just really fun to watch and beautiful, beautiful to see in the woods. So there are some ways that you guys can help woodpecker species in your yard. So for red-bellied woodpeckers, really any woodpecker species, um, but providing dead trees, whether it's for foraging. So if um, insects come in to decompose the wood, whether it's a standing dead tree, a snag, or even dead wood on the ground, woodpeckers will forage there. Um, if it is a standing dead snag, they can also use that as a possible nesting site. They will sometimes eat the fruit of berry trees. So you can consider planting um, hawthorn was one particular species that was referenced by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and um, other species that produce berries as well. If you are into bird feeders, suet is preferred by most woodpecker species. Uh, there are other options, peanuts, sunflower seeds that woodpeckers will eat, but that is their preference. And they have even been seen uh, taking nectar out of hummingbird feeders. So if any of you guys have witnessed that, that is super cool. And then for red-headed woodpeckers, they have a quite variable diet. They're more likely to feed on things like acorns and pecans and other fruits like mulberries. And again, they like the feeders filled with suet. So just some things to consider. I did research on artificial nest habitat for these two species and they're just not very likely to use them uh, according to the research that I've read. So these, your, your best option is to provide a, a snag for them, a standing dead tree or um, for nesting habitat or if you just wanna encourage them to provide food sources for them. True or false, male and female red-bellied woodpeckers look identical. And the answer is false. So the majority of them, th their bodies anyway, are similar, but they're not identical when you look at the head. So on the male is shown on your left. And if you look at the red coloration, it goes not only on the nape, the back of the neck, but also follows all the way up to the top of the head to where the bill um, emerges. And then if you contrast that with the female over here, you can see it's only on the, the nape, the back of the head or the neck and does not come up onto the crown. So that might be a fun little fact that you didn't know. I also read um, a fun fact on these woodpeckers that they can stick, you can kind of see this one's tongue extending out of its bill and it can extend two inches past this point. And their saliva is um, extra sticky to help with them getting grubs and fun things out of the wood that they are excavating. So super fun. I really enjoy watching woodpeckers whenever I get a chance to see them. Okay, so now we are moving on to our next uh, species comparison. This is another one that always, I could never quite remember how to tell these two apart. I knew they were different, but I didn't remember which one was called which. So hopefully I will help you here. So we have the American coot versus the common gallinule. So the American coot on the left, you can see, I mean, the main difference is probably obvious to you in the coloration of the bill and what we call the face shield. So the bill is white with kind of a little tip of red at the top on the American coot compared with the bright red face shield on the common gallinule and it's tipped with a little bit of yellow. Also, if you notice just the body coloration on the common gallinule, they have 
some of them refer to it as like a white racing stripe, but it just has a white um, along the edge of the wing here and also on both sides of the tail on the common gallinule that lacks on the American coot. If you see them side by side, the American coot is slightly larger than the gallinule. Um, that's not something that's like very obvious unless you have them side by side, but they do tend to occupy similar areas. So if you can figure out a fun catchy way to remember white goes with the American coot and red with the common gallinule, let me know because I've been picking my brain to try and help you guys out with a fun catchy way to remember, but it hasn't come to me yet. Um, and so, yeah, this is just a different image so here. So you can see that um, the stripe better here and the white on the edge of the tail with the common gallinule. And then why not show some cute little babies? <laughs> okay, so next up is another one that we might often confuse, which is the little blue heron and the tricolored heron, both of which are listed at the state level, so state designated as threatened. So we have the little blue heron here on your left, the tricolored heron there on your right, so you can see how they might be confused for one another. Overall, um, they do have similar coloration on their bodies. You can see it's they're both like a slate blue, but the little blue heron is entirely that color in the non-breeding season. It's mostly all this slate blue, gray, whatever color you want to call it. And on the um, right hand side with the tricolored heron, hence the name, there's a little bit of purple mixed in on the neck and then the underside of the species, both on the underside of the neck um, and the belly is white on the tricolored heron. You can also look at the bill of these species. So the bill of the little blue heron is again kind of like a <laughs> um, slate blue gray and then it's always tipped in like a almost black color contrasting with the yellow bill um, with a little bit of black on the tricolored heron. Now something to note and this really applies with all wading birds is during breeding season, they can go through color changes, especially along the face, the area around their eyes and bill, we call that area the lore. So you can see on the tricolored heron, it turns blue. <laughs> um, and similar, it gets a little bit more blue on the little blue heron. And the little blue heron's head and neck area turns like a kind of purplish color, which is similar to the tricolored. So in breeding season, they might be a little bit harder to tell apart. But again, you uh, wanna look for those white undersides of um, the tricolored heron. Our next species comparison is the yellow crowned night heron versus the black crowned night heron, which again, you might think the name would be a dead giveaway, and it kind of is, but it's not as easy to tell apart. So here's these two species. We have the yellow crowned night heron on the left and the black crowned night heron on the right. So you can see here, um, the black crown night heron has, well, a black crown. It's black on the top of the head compared with the yellow on um, the yellow crowned night heron. You can see overall, um, the coloration on the wings is also quite different on the yellow crown night heron. It's kind of a mix of different shades of, of gray compared to the very solid dark gray of the black crown night heron. And then the underside here, um, you can see is like a paler gray color on the black crown night heron. In terms of habitat, in general, the yellow crown night heron is often found in areas associated with salt water, whether it's brackish water or true ocean salt water. Um, compared to the black crown night heron that is often found. I'd say it's mixed, but uh, more so often seen with uh, freshwater habitats, but they can be found in both. So again, mostly you wanna be looking at the head area, just the coloration, look for this um, 
yellow cap on the yellow crown night heron, the black cap on the black crown night heron. But of course, there's a catch, which I think leads into my last poll question. So juvenile yellow crown night herons and black crown night herons look similar, but they can be told apart by which of the following? Their eyes, their wings, their bills, or their feet. So the correct answer is actually their bill. So they are similar in color and that they are both kind of this like mottled brownish gray. The um, neck to me is a little bit more distinct on the yellow crown night heron. They kind of have this big blocky head, but you can see the black crown night heron has a lighter colored bill versus the yellow crowned night heron has a darker colored bill. I know it's a little backwards in terms of how you can remember, but um, that's one thing you can look for when they're juveniles if you're ever unsure. Okay, and then we have the snowy egret versus the great egret. I think this is our last species comparison and then we will um, wrap up. So we have the snowy egret here on the left, the great egret here on the right, and you can see how they might be confused for one another. There are these big white waiting birds. So to tell these two apart, one thing to look at is just overall size, hence the name great egret. They're pretty um, big. <laughs> and that's often given to our larger um, waiting bird species like the great blue heron. And so you can see the two species contrasting here great egret is significantly larger than the snowy egret. You can also look at the feet. So again, my colleague James Stevenson always likes to say, it's an easy way to remember, if y'all know about yellow snow, just saying. <laughs> um, so the feet of the snowy egret are yellow compared with the black feet of the great egret. And then the color of the bill as well. The great egret's bill, is yellow compared with the black bill of the snowy egret. So if there's ways, you know, again, that you guys can remember, I think hopefully the yellow snow might be something that triggers in your brain next time you're out and about to remember, but you can always remember size as well. So in general, I just wanted to um, wrap up with some ways that you can help all bird species, and really this goes for a lot of other species as well of wildlife. So providing the essentials, so we all need food, cover, space, shelter, right, in order to survive. And so anything that we can do to enhance or provide these to our wildlife species will obviously be beneficial. Shannon and I always like to emphasize to limit our use of pesticides and rodenticides. So for our larger birds of prey, if you're using rodenticides and there's poison in the rodents that the birds of prey then ingest, that can be harmful to them. Um, and then pesticides, obviously, most of us think about DDT and the effects of that. So just thinking about uh, our application and be sure that you're using them as directed on the label. Um, and using them really as a last resort. Picking up litter, again, can be helpful just to prevent species from accidentally uh, ingesting any garbage that we have left behind. If you can participate in restoration projects, so a lot of environmental nonprofit groups around the state offer ways that you can participate in tree plantings or just in general habitat restoration, whether it's um, with uh, marshy areas or doing uh, pine plantings, upland, wetland, wherever it is, anything that we're doing to enhance habitat is a benefit to many wildlife species. And then Shannon and I have done several presentations focusing on wildlife habitat and specifically with birds. So I encourage you guys to check out our recordings of our past webinars on our YouTube channel. We'll plug that at the end. And I will be sure to include those links as well in the follow-up email. So I just wanted to plug some options for you. If you're more of a book person, there's um, some good books from Sibley or Audubon that you can investigate. 
there's some really good um, iPhone applications that you can use as well. Merlin Bird is the um, smartphone app that is put on and out by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. It's very user friendly and highly recommend that one, especially for beginners. And then there's also eBird and iNaturalist, if you guys are familiar with those. And those incorporate more of a citizen science aspect. So when you report a sighting that gets logged into a massive database so that scientists around the world can see where these species are, if they're moving, if they're migrating, what's changing. So it's just a really fun way that you can contribute to science right from the comfort of your home or from your smartphone. And so I want to thank you guys so much for tuning in to today's webinar on Birds of Florida.